All right. So welcome to Bootstrap Hour. It's up to an hour of Rachel Murphy's time, legend, bootstrapper, eight-figure exit, extraordinaire. I'm trying to just pluck words out from here. So uh, let us know you're there. Say good morning. Morning, Chris. Where you at? How's it going? Rebecca, morning. May end up with no signal. School run. See, I told you, school run is a thing for people, but I'm loving mm-hmm. Well, listen, I, I've said we're very happy to uh, to move to another time, providing it's not the evening, because uh, let's face it, I'm bloody useless. Um, I am struggling a bit, though, Joe, because if I put, tell me how to put the uh, LinkedIn on without hearing the noise in the background. You just mute it. Yeah, but then I'm muting my laptop, aren't I? And you can't hear me. No, 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 no. you mute the actual live down in the bottom hand left hand on the right hand corner oh yes 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 now there's two welcome guys because this is what happens we we might as well be real we might as well be real (laughs) with our live and you learn something new every day i don't know why i feel like this is the first time we've done this but then uh, that's a recurring theme oh uh do you know what b uh rebecca has already come in with a question i think it's because she's uh on a school run so she's worried she's gonna lose signal but basically essentially this is your opportunity to ask questions for up to an hour with rachel about business bootstrapping a business starting it in the middle of it in the thick of things i would say no questions off the table but hey we don't know yet (laughs) that's very easy of you to say mate thank you for that um i think i'll be the judge of no questions off the table providing it relates to business very comfortable there we go um we do also have some dm questions from people that can't be here but let's actually hit rebecca's question can you advise when is the right time to go from side hustle to full-time business now i know side hustles are always a big thing like everybody must have a side hustle but when do you turn it to full time? Um, that's a great question. And I guess my immediate response to that would be focused around revenue. So at the point it starts to feel like it can cover your costs from a living life perspective, um, you know, whether that's covering mortgage, car payment, food shop, whatever it is. Um, that's the point, really, that you start to think about stepping out of um, whatever kind of full time employment you've got and moving to uh, to, to running something um, more full time. So I know lots of people are running side hustles, and I think that's the uh, that's the balancing act, really, is making sure that you've got sufficient coverage. What you don't want to do is jump out the frying pan into the fire and, um, uh, oh, the question's appeared on screen. This is revolutionary, this tech. Um, but but I, I think it's, it's that balancing act. So purely from a revenue perspective, I mean, I think there's an easy argument with a side hustle that says we're not enjoying it. You'd be binning that off anyway. So let's make the assumption you are enjoying it. It's good fun. It's good crack. But it, you need to get it to the point where it's actually going to wash its own face and from there, you need a clear plan on how you're going to grow it. Otherwise, your revenue uh, stays uh, stays where it is. Um, does that answer your question, Rebecca? <clears throat> oh, morning, Gemma. Morning, morning. And, well, let's hope that she's not texting and driving while... Listening to this, I phone the police in the uh, you know in the southeast area and warn them. So exactly, um, exactly. Um, that's really interesting. She's actually come back with a another a, yes, ma'am. She says that question was answered. What we're going to do is we come to a DM that we've had as well. So this is on a slightly different. That. Because let's face it, last time they went here, there and everywhere, nothing made sense. So one of the questions that we had was, and this is a really interesting one, is, is it possible to be too nice as a leader? Yes. <laughs> yes. So um, that, that would be my gut feel response. <clears throat> I, I think uh, 
this is a this is a good question. I spend a lot of time with founders of businesses that are um, on paper too nice. And what do I mean by that? I mean they're not having some of the honest conversations that they need to be having. Um, it's this is something a topic that came up at our breakfast um, yesterday as well. Um, you know, if you are promoting people because they're around um, and, you know, you're promoting them into roles from a leadership perspective and you're not giving them the skills or they're not learning the skills, then you've got a real challenge there as a business starts to scale up. But a lot of the time, um, what I see with leaders that are too nice is they don't want to have the honest conversations or the tough conversations, be that performance, be that, um, you know, value add uh, with staff over and above the role that they're doing. Um, and I think that creates an environment of uh, resentment, ultimately, from the leader uh, of the business, because, um, you know, they, they get frustrated that their team are therefore not, you know, um, progressing at the speed that they, they want to. Um, I, I've couched that very much in a business owner response rather than a generic leader. Um, I think if you're working in a much larger corporate um, and somebody else is paying all the salaries and money, um, it is much easier to um, find yourself in an environment where you're not running a PL um, and um, there is more flexibility around operating. Um, in that way, I'm not saying all startup business leaders are wankers. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is we've got to be uber commercial. We are running businesses. Um, and, and therefore, you know, if you're running a startup, you have to be very focused on the cash flow of the organization. Um, and does that, you know, mean that you come across in a negative way? Um, I, I sincerely hope not. But I think what, what it does is it really encourages tough conversations and having open dialogue with your team. My business know exactly where we are from a cash flow, from a growth perspective, where we're going, what we're doing. I wouldn't say that they think I'm too nice. Um, I would say that they probably think I'm quite informal. And some people make the mistake of thinking informal is too nice. Uh, and plenty of people have probably learned the lesson, lesson with me over time that just because I'm super informal doesn't mean that, I, that I'm not a serious businesswoman and I will be expecting my pound of flesh when I'm paying somebody to fulfill an outcome. Anyway, I'll jump back off my soapbox now. Woof, got me on a uh, sensitive subject here this morning. Wow, that one uh, I thought was going to be a really simple... Yes, it's too. It is possible to be too nice. However, I think I've heard you use the word candor before, and does that play into you know? Actually, are you being nice if you're. Well, it's one of my favourite books, that radical candor, and uh, the reason it's one of my favourite books is is very instinctive. I think for it's more instinctive for me now. I would have struggled personally as a leader with conflict 10, 15 years ago. I struggle a lot less with it these days. Um, and that is not to say that I openly enjoy it. I do at certain times of the month. But anyway, let's stay on message. Uh, so I, I think, um, I just think being open and honest uh, about the environment, what's going on, what you expect of people means that everybody is clear and knows how to show up that's not to say there's not challenge, debate, discussion, all of that. Um, but I think it's really important to be honest and authentic as a leader rather than prioritising being nice. Interesting. Okay. Now, if this was an evening situation, I'd be saying take a shot for every time I say the word interesting. However, maybe just take a, a shot of coffee for every time I say that word. I'll put that I'll put the part on. Hold on. Yeah, Andre. we'll all be buzzing. Um, the follow-on question for Rebecca on that too nice of the leader is, how do you manage when someone is taking advantage of a leader being too nice? 
How do you manage when someone is taking advantage of a leader? But I think that's really for the leader to manage. I mean, the hint's in the title. If they're in a senior role, um, that's up to them to handle, uh, would be my my advice. If, if you're working into that leader, um, one would assume that there is two-way communication, you know, objectives set in discussions should be two-way. And, and I'd expect to be feeding back to my boss, um, you know, what, what I thought of their performance as much as hearing about what they think about mine. Um, so, yeah, I guess to a certain extent, it's a fine line. You know, there's the shop steward bit, trying to do everybody else's job, having a view on everybody else. Or there is the, you know, if you're working into that person, how, yeah, that circular dialogue. That feedback loop should be in place to say, listen, little Johnny, you know, um, I don't think you're being, not, not so much I don't think you're being, but I've noticed, you know, and um, I, I, I'm flagging a bit of a, this doesn't really feel right, um, create an environment where people can have a conversation. I, I think the, the days of old school hierarchy for me are long gone. But I'm unusual in that. There will be some bosses who are not going to appreciate that feedback. So I guess it's it's know the environment that you're that you're in. Um, but if if it was me as the leader, I would want to hear that I was being too nice um, from a member of the team. Okay. All right. All right. We have another question that's come in. I will give you the background and then. Uh, it's from Gemma, and then she's gone. I've forgotten to add the question. So from Gemma, we have question for a middle management position. We have a junior team member who is underperforming by a lot and has been with us for four years. I'm in the leadership team with the owners, and they just don't act on it. So I think here is like a almost like a family business, which makes it harder. We meet regularly and discuss it, but not actions uh, happens, just talk. It's frustrating from my side as they want him to progress, but it's like banging my head against a brick wall, <laughs> trying to get him to do anything. I feel like this is probably something that a lot of managers and leaders have experienced. Their argument is that he's a nice guy and does holiday cover. What's the best way to broach it with the owners? I'm just rereading that question. It's a long junior, one. Junior team member, underperforming, leadership team, they just don't want to act on it. I mean, the, the reality is, as a business, there should be a objective set in and performance process in any organisation, however big or small. Uh, and the reality is, if it's a small business, and somebody isn't pulling their weight, here's the news, it's having a direct impact on other staff. And ultimately, they are going to say, thank you very much, but I have to exit stage left because I'm picking up work because you're not handling this member of staff. In a small business, when somebody, you know, goes sick on the regular, doesn't do the stuff that they need to do, it falls to other people to pick it up. So I would be encouraging Gemma to, in her conversations with the owners of the business, be really explicit that that work is either not going to be getting picked up um, or seek clarification around what the objective and performance process is in the business um, and taking a relatively hard line on that. The, the, the reality, of course, is when she gets sick enough of it, she's going to leave anyway um, because... In a small business, you can't and you don't, um, you just can't continue to operate like, like that for an extended period. So I think, you know, if she's already had the conversation with the owners of the business, um, then it needs to be a, you know, almost formally logging it to say, I'm not picking up um, any additional work. Uh, and if they continue to want to, let this ride, then um, it will have a, a direct impact on morale and on staffing. So um, ultimately, it's going to bite the owners on the arse. It's just a matter of time as to uh, how and when. Be assured, coming at some point. <laughs> yeah, and um, so we'll pop back to another DM that we had. And this one is, 
more oh, about... we've got a question from Phil, actually. I've just Yeah, seen. yeah, we're just pinging around. Oh, we've got some right, ones totally. as well. Are you trying to keep your message? All right, go ahead. I love that. Now that you've got access to the comments, you're like, no, I'm I'm running this show. It'll be a tiny little bit of information and off I run. Oh, yeah. It's like wrangling a three-year-old. We need reins. Um, When you're bootstrapping without a big pile of investor cash in the bank, what advice can you share about how to manage cash flow, particularly when trying to scale to bigger projects? Within an inch of its fucking life is the honest answer. So I'm about to start a series of vlogs on financial management. It sounds like the dullest topic imaginable. Um, However, it is so incredibly crucial for a business. It's something that we're 15, 16 months old as a business, and we are constantly wrangling with this for varying reasons. Um, People not paying on time, people not paying at all, businesses going into administration and the start dates get pushed back and, and, and. The list goes on of exciting reasons why things haven't gone as planned. Um, So for me, I would say it's about your appetite for risk Um, as a founder. And I've noticed my risk appetite change quite dramatically, actually, over running um, businesses over the last 10 or 15 years. So um, I do think uh, that there is a balancing act um, around managing that cash flow and taking some risks. Um, and but, but as a rule of thumb, it depends a lot whether you're a services business or you're a SaaS-based business because if you've got recurring revenue coming in, then that does make it easier to forecast. If you're a services business, then the chances are you can only forecast three to six months out when you are at a reasonable size. Um, What we started to do at Different, once we got 12-month gigs with clients, was we started hiring permanent people, which enabled us to make more margin on the deals. Um, So there needs to be sufficient of a core team to run and grow the business. Um, And it's it's the first balancing act is when do you move just from a founder to that, you know, that next first hire and who that person is? Can they do what you do? Um, Or are you looking to just widen out uh, the skills of the team? But what you do not do is is have benched staff that are not billable because that is the fastest way to send a consultancy business, services business down the toilet. So people need to be covering their own cost. Um, and it is a balance net, is the is the God's don, you know, the God's honest answer. Um, you need to be confident about your ability confident in your service, you need to have understood the market actually wants to buy what you're taking to market. And you also really need to know um, an idea of of how long the business can actually run if you weren't to write any new business for a period of time. Now, most bootstrap businesses are on a shoestring. um, But if you can run for that six-month period and cover key staff costs, then you could argue it's time to push that risk envelope a wee bit and make some of those moves. Uh, but but I, I I personally would say my risk profile from the last business to this one is distinctly different. Uh, so I will take bigger risks now than I would have done before. I would take bigger risks on hiring people in. Um, and that probably explains why I have a, a stronger management team now um, than I had at the sale of the last business, albeit our revenues are nowhere near. So it's a uh, it's a balancing act is the honest uh, answer. Yeah, and like as you say, is it because of the stronger management team that you are more confident in taking those risks? I think from a delivery perspective, yes. From a writing new business perspective. Um, we're at the infancy of getting that right with this management team. And so I think it's also um, 
it's it's understanding some of my personal drivers and motivations. So I know myself a lot better uh, this time round. And uh, I'm also really clear. I don't want that dysfunctional family vibe I had last time. I want a high performing team. And if you can't be part of that, this business is not going to be for, you know, for, for the team around me. Um, and I guess, um, I guess it's also that this is going to turn into a therapy session, but I think it's also the bit around, um, I have achieved some of my goals. And so therefore some of the pressure is off. Um, you know, the, the, the pressure in this head, trust me, is always there. Um, but some of the pressure is off in way of how hard and how fast we go this time. Awesome. Good question. Good question. All right. Now we will go to Phil Bottle, who is getting the kids ready for school. So hopefully he's still here. If not, he'll be able to replay it. So we have, can you clarify the difference between working on the business and working in the business? And when should you draw the line? Now, I know you wrote about this not that long ago. Um, it's one of my favorite subjects, this. So ideally, I would like to spend all my time working on and not in the business. That is a luxury that we definitely cannot afford at this stage. Um, but what I mean by working on is around making sure that the strategy is right. We are constantly testing that, that the product market fit or service market fit is right. And we are continuing to test that. And that the strategic angles and where we're planning to go and working back from a you know, five-year plan or a three-year plan uh, are actually in place. Um, and that we are going after you know, the, the next big thing rather than just business as usual turnover. So um, uh, when do you draw the line on that? Is that, that again, is, is, is a tricky one to find the balance on. It depends on cash flow forward plan from a business as usual perspective. But um, the, if somebody in the business doesn't have their eye on where are you going, you are therefore just going to be very much a, a slave to the market and be dictated to. Um, so all of the businesses that we're working with, we encourage them to think about exit in some shape, way or form. That's not sending to the highest bidder. You know, it may well be, but it could be lots of things. It could be a management buyout, um, could be um, you know, uh, selling some of the IP of the business. But, but if there isn't a clear strategic plan of where the business is going to, stuff is going to happen to the business. Um, and so it is super important that somebody and your management team ultimately spend time working on and not just in. So it's super exciting for us kind of founders who can roll up our sleeves, put a shift in, um, build the services, do the delivery, chase the money, you know, do some sales, um, but but if we haven't got a big chunk of time on where are we actually going as a business, you could argue we've built ourselves a job and not a business. And I have not done this to build myself a job. Let me be clear, because I could probably go and earn more in a bloody job tomorrow, um, albeit I'm paying the arse to manage. So let's not get thinking that's too sexy an idea. Um, I can't imagine judging by that response there'll be too many job offers rolling into my uh, inbox this morning anyway i don't know someone might pop and go did you hear rachel said on a live she might prefer a job over this i don't Wait, know that's not, that's not what she said what she <laughs> said is she could, be, she could be earning more today um do, doing a job but the reality is it's about building that legacy again and it's about fulfilling another ambition for me i want to help founders to create freedom um and i you know i know how to do that because i've been on that journey myself um if i was to go and take a job firstly i have to have a boss secondly they have to deal with me and thirdly there is no third i can't conceive of the idea let's move along to the next question <laughs> it's just not happening phil says perfect answer thank you i would give you a job now Looking at that, NHS workforce, workforce Rebel is in his title. Um, can't see how that wouldn't go uh, go down quite well. 
I um, well, it's funny because I would give Phil a job actually. So now we're we're talking uh, we're talking trading jobs, um, but uh, that's, that's a conversation Phil and I have offline at another point. <laughs> Here we go, making it happen. All right, we're going to switch gears then. And uh, Rebecca actually had another question for you way back at the beginning, which was. How do you think social media plays a role in starting a business now? It feels as if there is no social presence, then a business may not get the start it could need. Can, oh yes, we've got her question on the screen. Um, let me just reread that. <coughs> yeah, well, you're talking to someone who's a bit of a social media whore. Um, so I would always say, uh, that social media needs to play part of uh, the role of any business, um, albeit I'm regularly challenged around just how much I actually use social. And I was challenged very heavily by a fellow CEO yesterday who said, you really should be on Insta. Um, you know, there is a huge market you're not tapping into. I was about to say and, 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 but then I've corrected myself because that new ludicrous phrase of mine won't be getting airtime this morning. Um, I think that a social media presence is essential uh, for a business because the days of popping in, share my age here, the days of popping into the news agent and seeing the little card where somebody is offering their services um, are long gone. You know, we, we were talking earlier this week around lead generation. The analogy I used was when I was 14, I was doing some telesales, absolutely loved it for a kitchen and bathroom company. And, you know, the AI lead gen is now the new telesales, um, albeit, you know, much more targeted, um, much more fluent probably than I was at 14. Um, but but I do think that there is a need for a presence in the shape and form of, you know, a, a shop window with a very basic website and social media. And I, I think, you know, that we're into a world of influencers, micro, macro, et cetera. Um, and I just think the ability to get your own stuff out there far outstrips the potential that we had 10 years ago. So why wouldn't you? Um, but you're talking to somebody who won't get an account and use it on TikTok because I do fear for my life. Um, I already waste too much time on social media. It's something I'm actively looking at at the minute from a kind of, you know, a very addictive personality perspective. So I don't want to be adding TikTok or any of the other you know, um, platforms that I don't use for business into, into my lineup. Um, that being said, in, it depends on the nature of the business as well. Not all businesses are suited to every platform, um, but I would say name a business that isn't, sorted, that isn't suited to any platform, and that would be hard uh, these days, in, in my personal opinion. But I, I'm not afraid of a camera. Love being on social, love having a chat, love being very open about that conversation. And I know that that is not necessarily usual. If I think even about my own family, every one of us runs businesses, not one of them are on social media apart from me. Uh, so it's horses for courses. And I think to add to that is that while your business can be on social media, doesn't mean that you then have to be personally on social media. However, with depending on the business, people like people and to be able to show up and show the people behind the business is always a great thing. Um, the only thing is with social media is you, you do get the armchair people going, oh, I could do that on social media. It'd be easy. But actually, well, you've got to be shifting. It's time. Yeah. That's the same, Joe, as, you know, when uh, England are in the bloody World Cup and some arsehole down the pub who's never been to a yeah. gym is giving it the, no, no, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. Um, and, and that, you know, you're always going to have that. And, and social media has given license to everybody having a voice. And so, therefore, um, you'd run the risk of that. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's, it is... In my opinion, I, I, I would, if I was building any business, I'd have it on social. Yeah. But you've got to put a shift in, to quote Rachel Murphy. 
you got to put you shift in. Put shift in, albeit, you know, there's plenty of SaaS based businesses that would not talk about people in the way that we do as service based companies. Mm. Because it's, you know, their business model is distinctly different. Everything, you know, would be much more automated. Um, it is that customer attraction. Um, and you could argue, you know, it's there's more machinery around the technology and the process, the software that runs that stuff. They do not showcase their people. But in professional services businesses, um, the business is really a run by people. Um, and so, you know, ultimately, as you start to think about exit, you have to be able to create that playbook. And you really want, um, if I'm being really candid, you want the person, um, you, you want to be having the processes fulfilled by somebody at a more junior level than needing a senior person on everything the whole time from a cost perspective. Um, and that is the reality of business. Um, however, that takes a, you know, it takes a, a chunk of time to, to get to and to, uh, and to build out. Plenty of businesses don't achieve it. But, but equally from a SaaS based business perspective, this nirvana of the 75% margin, I mean, show me one that has, please. Lovely. Onwards. Someone, sure. All right, we'll go to the DMs. And what we've got here is communication one. And how should I communicate change and transformation with my team slash wider business? Honestly, openly, authentically, regularly um, <clears throat> would be my immediate advice. The amount of businesses that get this wrong astonishes me. It is not rocket science to just say, this is something, this is what we're doing today. This is where we're moving to. It's going to feel different. It's going to look different. Everyone's uncomfortable with change. We're here to support you and work it through. Um, however, that is not the approach for most businesses. And therefore, it causes more uncertainty than it should, more nervousness. Um, I think things like an old-fashioned racy or RC model, as I prefer to call it, help here. Because not everybody has a voice either in these things. Some people just need to be told this is what's happening and this, you know, this is the direction of travel. And um, that there, there, there are a number of roles and organizations where you just need to create an environment where you do actually talk to and hear back from and have that conversation. That doesn't need to turn into a bloody kibbutz. That can move to a, we've had a conversation, you're still unhappy, but here's the news, this is a direction of travel. Um, and, and, and that is where I think people get it wrong. Um, we're, doing, <coughs> we're doing work today in the grafter around a RACI and an RC model. Um, to make sure that we are uh, getting what we need as a business um, and that we're not duplicating effort anywhere uh, and that people are uh, accountable, responsible, consulted and informed. Um, and, and that doesn't mean everybody, every minute of every day um, has an opinion on stuff. It means the accountable and responsible people um, for certain functions, tasks, outcomes will help um, enable that um, and, and drive it drive it through but just being human normally helps in my opinion actually talking to people one would hope that you've hired people who can do the job and that you've built a relationship and trust with so why would you then not treat them like that and have a conversation about change and transformation I do know you know, there are some things that have to be kept confidential. My last business, I sold to a listed business. I couldn't tell everybody. I found it very hard personally um, because I wanted to be honest and it, I felt like I was being dishonest. Um, but that is for me to manage and own as a business leader. That is not for me to, you know, impress my, or oh, I feel a bit out of sorts on the rest of the team. Your role as a founder is to manage uh, you know, manage the business and, and move it, move it along and through. Um, but 
honestly, authentically, openly human um, would be my uh, would be my advice. But so many businesses get this wrong, and it just causes unnecessary distress. Can I ask you that? Another soapbox <laughs> moment, that one. But yes, please go ahead. What is that? Second, third one already in the summer? Uh, <laughs> with that, um, how to communicate? You say that so many businesses get it wrong. Is there a key thing that a lot of businesses do wrong so people can catch themselves going? You know, is there something that you see across different businesses that it's the same thing that they get wrong? I think it's just the lack of treating people um, openly and authentically and like they're actually adults. People are not going to, you know, race out the door if they hear this change in the business. They're going to air their concerns. They're going to want to have a conversation. And there's loads of ways to do that individually and as a group. But but I think the, the biggest issue I see is not tackling that head on. It's a little bit like going back to the I'm too nice as a leader. Are you really too nice? Because you don't actually want to deal with any of the tricky stuff. People businesses are tricky. People are tricky. Um, and that's um, that's the nature of uh, us as human beings. So I think um, I think it's the it's probably a bit of the honesty and it's probably Inherently, people dislike conflict, um, and so they think, oh, geez, let's just kick that can down the road a bit, and we'll get a bit further in the planning of the project. And it's like, if when you're making a change in a business, everybody bloody senses something's going on, and it becomes EastEnders. It's noisy, it's a load of chat, it's a load of theories, people are off the boil, they're not concentrating on work, so... Just run a bloody all hands. Let them talk to you as the leader of the business. Have an open conversation. You're going to get some challenge, but here's the news. You're supposed to be a leader. You're supposed to be able to deal with that. And you're not going to make people happy the whole time. So um, I think having those conversations and then being clear about what's actually going to happen is key. But you must have those conversations. You know, businesses that send a fucking video out, Announcing a big change, criminal, uh, completely unacceptable. Um, that that should not uh, be allowed. Um, and if you're in a in a senior role, strap a pair on uh, and have those conversations. Many to edit. Many to edit around that time. Yeah. <laughs> I do oh, not no, like maybe me... we're on a LinkedIn live. Shit, I can't. <laughs> It made me laugh just because it made me think about actually like, you know, back at uh, the old business of doing all hands and the ability to be able to ask questions and not feel like you weren't allowed or that it was a bad thing to ask questions and air it. It was a safe space to be able to just go, I don't get this or why are we doing this? And and I guess that's the thing. If you can't communicate, then you probably don't have a, a safe space, a safe culture to be able to to open up and, and do it that way. So and people are not going to stay because ultimately people are going to get irate with that environment and they're going to exit stage left. Um, you know, market is hopping up uh, in way of opportunities. Um, there is, again, we're seeing a shift. We saw the announcement from Amazon yesterday, everyone back to the office, uh, you know, non-negotiable and more and more businesses are heading in that work, in that direction again. Um, but but I think um, without getting sidetracked, um, if you haven't created an environment where people can have those conversations, more for you, because that is not a business of the 21st century. Mm, indeed, indeed. All right, we'll go back to questions from LinkedIn. So we've got a few lined up now. And interestingly enough, you say about Amazon, Ask, uh, t- telling everybody to go back to to the uh, offices, which we've seen several times over since the pandemic. Rebecca asks, what's your take on flexible working as a business? So it's really easy for me in the nature of the business that I run. We run a remote first business. I have a CTO who is currently based in Greece who has been traveling from the UK to Greece over the last couple of weeks and continuing to work and deliver. Uh, So um, 
I personally am more relaxed, I think, than many people running businesses. Um, I think the other bit is uh, I have a very senior experienced team around me. Um, so when you're growing people through, it's really hard because how do you show them what is acceptable in the workplace? How do you show them, you know, the, the stuff that you learn in an office like osmosis or, you know, where there's somebody shouting over about something and people are picking stuff up or let me just show you how to do that for 20 minutes instead of let's book a call for four friggin' hours while we work it through. So I personally like being in an office um, and I would like to be in an office at least a couple of days a week. That's the God's honest truth. That is not where my business is today. Um, <clears throat> but I also like the flexibility of being able to fulfill my role from anywhere. So I like my cake and eat it standard practice. Um, I do think that, um, I think people are chances um, and that's why I love people. But I think there's an awful lot of taking the piss when people work at home. That's my view. I think there's side hustles. I think there's <laughs> a lot of different gigs going on. I think there are cheeky lunches, cheeky brunch. I think there's loads of stuff because people are operators. Now, if you are still delivering your outcomes, for me, I don't care if you're on the moon. Um, and that's the God's honest truth. Um, however, um, I do think that um, I'm, I'm highly unusual in that. There are still plenty of businesses that want people in the office. They want to be able to eyeball them uh, and see what they're up to and what they're, what they're doing. I think that we will ultimately move to a hybrid model. There'll be some in the office and there'll be some remote. Um, I think telling people they're back five days a week in an office. Um, that's a business model that I personally couldn't support as a leader today. Um, but that's because I wouldn't want it myself and I wouldn't ask my team to do something I wouldn't do myself. Um, so that's that's my, my response on it. But it goes back to are you measured on outcomes or are you measured on outputs? And is it clear? It's all the way back to the earlier conversation. I'm a nice leader. Are you really? Do your team know what is expected of them? Um, and I think um, I think there's huge amounts of work to do around how you manage people uh, and teams, get the best out of. Um, but but I, I I would yeah I, I would struggle. I I couldn't imagine working up five days a week rather bore my head. Um, but I really could imagine being in an office two days a week with my team. I'd fucking love it um, because yeah. I think we get a shed load of stuff done faster. Even a day a week I'd take at the minute. I reckon it would really help us move faster as a business. Um, but my team are all over the place. So CTO is currently in Greece. Um, Chief Commercial Officer is based down in Weymouth. Uh, I'm in London. You know, uh, content legend is in Essex Massive. Um, so we've got people all over. Uh, so where do we get them? You know, our chairman is his Manchester way. Um, and so, yeah, we need to is get it, But we will. I think, and that actually pops into my brain as well, is, is asking people, you know, especially with going into London and things like that, and the cost um, and how how costly things have become and so so difficult from an economic perspective personally is that then asking people to to then pay to come in becomes even a, a stress in itself but do the business think about that or do they go well that's up to you work with us or, work, or not work with us um yes, you know that goes, that goes back to hey, starting a role doesn't it and being happy with the salary um, mm. So that, that to me is a separate issue, actually. Um, it's if, if you're signing up for something and you're not happy with it, is the news. Don't sign up for it. Um, and but 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 if there's an expectation that a couple of days of the week you're going to be in person and you see that salary uh, and you know that that's the expectation, be prepared to get your ass yeah. in and happen. Um, oh, absolutely, yeah. Lost upon you and it's a change. 
Um, but but a lot of people like to play the always been thrust upon me because during COVID, it's like we're not in a pandemic anymore, are we? So let's move along. Um, and and so I do think there's there's different schools of uh, schools of thought around that. Um, I personally think that model of some intense work together over a two or three day period in a different environment actually would be very powerful. Um, but then I again, I, I do think about these things in a slightly different way and like to create an environment that is, you know, as much social and team building um, as well as actually delivering some work. You know, we ran an event yesterday and had two or three hours planning out social media strategy, um, our offer for a new service. And that that was fantastic because you've got high energy, people buzzed for an event, working in a nice environment, um, you know, had lunch as part of that process. It's not sitting in a boring office going, can I have you for an hour for a meeting? <laughs> Uh, do you know what I mean? It's it's but 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 again, it it depends an awful lot on uh, the nature of the business. Yeah, yeah, it's it's an interesting one, and I'm sure we'll be seeing more and more of people going back to the office and then rolling it back. Let's move on. Bill has come back, and he is. If you started a new bootstrap funded business today, and you had to choose one key area to focus on first, what would it be? You have limited cash, so you cannot focus or recruit into all areas, sales, brand, culture, art. You're smiling. I feel like you like this question. I like this question. Sales, Phil. Sell, <laughs> sell, sell, my friend, um, because um, I know you can deliver. Uh, and so that's that's the bit. I know a little bit about your business, and therefore I'm comfortable uh, responding. That's because you've got proven track record. You've got a service that delivers outcomes. Um, you've got a an existing client base, uh, and so sell, sell, sell. If we talked about a business completely clean, brand new, <coughs> day one, and it was bootstrapped, um, you'd need a couple more variables. You'd need to know: is it a services business? Is it a product? And what? do you have as an individual in way of skills? Because you can't take something to market if you have not built it and have no service or no no idea. Um, But as a founder, you must be able to sell. Um, And um, you don't need to be the best salesperson on the planet, but you must be able to sell. Ideally, sell and deliver. And that's exactly where I started the Grafter 15, 16 months ago. You know, we didn't have anybody in for let me work this through reese came in in september uh launched the service in may came in part-time in september and i've been building it since january so for 10 months uh i ran all sales and delivery myself uh and then he came in and then we started to get additional part-time people in off the back of that um so for me personally um, it depends a lot on the skills of the founder. Um, but I would rather sell something um, and have an idea of, of what I'm actually going to deliver. So I built out eight figure exit and spent I don't know, six, seven, eight months building that um, before going out to market. I'm a delivery girl. So it's going to deliver what, whatever the cost is going to deliver. And so, therefore, um, I'm probably 75% delivery, 25% sales. Um, In hindsight, should I have pulled a salesperson in before another delivery person? Possibly. Um, But, yeah, you you need both sides of the coin. So you you need to have something and you need to be able to sell it. Um, that's uh, That's the key priority. The rest of it... Brand, culture, ops, all has to be secondary, I'm afraid. Um, my, my advice would be get a shitter organiser in, even if it's a PA type who can support you as a founder, even part-time. Um, that was my first hire into the grafter uh, because uh, that role for me is so incredibly essential. Um, and that role over time has expanded and has become more than a PA type. Um, but 
yeah, for, for me, having somebody who can do the organisation of me means that I can just show up and like a bloody performing monkey and deliver. Um, but, but I do need that level of organisation uh, around me. <clears throat> Very long answer there, Phil. Definitely one of my favourite subjects. Long answer is sales. All right. Brilliant. So we have uh, Emily Price, who has dropped into LinkedIn Live, and she is asking, can you provide some insight about your recruitment tactics to ensure you hire the right people? Um, hey, Emily, um, thank you for joining. Um, can I... Oh, thank you, Joe. Can I provide some insight about recruitment tactics to ensure you hire the right people? I think this is one of the biggest challenges businesses have. Um, and I think it's because they don't know enough about what they're actually trying to do with that person or that role. So um, there's something that I have built out, which I will happily share by email. If you can ping us your email, which is a role profile tool, and it asks an individual to actually spend time tracking what they do on a day to day basis over the period of a week or a month. Uh, and as a hiring manager of a gap in the structure, it really allows that hiring manager to identify what do they actually need from this role? And is it realistic that it is one person? Is it part time? Is it outcome based, etc. So I think being really clear about what the gap is you're trying to fill is is key. Um, and I think a super thorough recruitment process. And by that, I don't necessarily mean a three or four stage. What we did hiring our CTO into the grafter was we probably spent seven hours with him having conversations about where the business was at, taking him through our strategy, asking for his views on where we were strategically, what gaps could he fill in the business today, and how would it work um, and that wasn't just with me, that was also with our chief commercial officer. So we'd spent a full working day um, in way of conversations before Chris joined the business. And that enabled us to really understand where he was going to add value. But it also made him crystal clear on the maturity of our business before we landed. So there were no surprises. Um, and I think that is a great way to go about it. Somebody else I've done some work with before, a chap called Dennis Cruz. What Dennis does is he actually issues really short-term contracts to everybody when he's done a shortlist for a role and he actually gets them to do some work and see how they actually work. Um, now, that's more in the development space and it's easier to quantify that work. Um, but I think that's a great idea because it's the ultimate try before you buy with a tiny short-term contract. So there's no long-term commitment. There's maybe, I think in his case, he may do five days worth of work. Um, he, he may listen to this and say, actually, it was five hours, Roach. But um, I think that really understanding what you're looking for, <clears throat> having a very flexible process um, that allows absolute honesty about the role and about the business is key. Um, and I do think then some of the old fashioned having a racy or an RC around who's actually doing what, where as a business and good old fashioned objectives, set some objectives for the company, set those objectives for your permanent team and track them on a monthly basis as a minimum. We do that within the grafter and we're 15 months old. Um, so, you know, the, the, the permanent core senior team around around me we we sit and we go through those on a monthly basis um so really happy emily to share that role profile tool um if that's of use and we'll find a way to grab your email and i hope that answers your question awesome and so we have five minutes left so one last question, which actually I completely scrolled past. So I do apologize, Gemma. Last question of the day, and then we shall carry on our merry way. How do you know or measure what actually moves the needle and needs your pers personal attention versus what, act what is actually important or can be delegated? 
Can you put that question? Oh, yeah, you have. Um, well, I think that has to go back to the strategy of the business. So you said, Gem, you're in a leadership role. So I would assume what you're doing is tied to the strategy of the business. Um, if it's not, then um, I'd be questioning what you were doing. Um, is is the honest answer. Um, in way of do you have to do it yourself or do you have a member of your team who is better um, or has more capacity or it falls into the, should it really be you or them doing it? Um, I think that's, I mean, that's a subjective one depending upon the priorities and the strategy of the organisation. Um, but I think businesses are particularly poor at having. Um, everyone has a strategy or talks a good game about having a strategy. Um, but do they take it to the next level and say, this is what's on the plan for the next three months? And do they take it to the level where they say, these are the company objectives for the next three months? Make sure everybody understands those. Because that would give you an immediate checkpoint to say, am I actually doing this to add value to the strategy? Or is this just a an outdated task on my list of stuff that needs happening? And I guess as a leader, <clears throat> you would probably be better served than me to know whether you do the task or a member of your team does it. Um, again, there's a lot of nuances in there. Um, but it does go back to really understanding what your role is, what the role of the member of the team is, uh, and what the priorities are uh, across the uh, across the organisation. Um, yeah, there's there's a few more questions, a few more answers. I think I would need to be a bit clearer um, around uh, around that point. But I hope that uh, I hope that's helped. Awesome. All right. We're going to leave it there because it's two minutes to nine. Now, I put in the comments. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Those questions were really, really insightful. Um, next week's Strap It Out will be on Wednesday, the 16th of October. So we hope to see you there. If not, and you need some questions answered, always, always DM us. Thank you to Phil, Emily, Rebecca, Gemma, and the DMs that we got as well. Uh, Rachel, would you like to add anything before we say goodbye? The only thing I want to add is next time for Bootstrapper, we've got some music um, that we're having made. Um, and so think Hot Stepper, um, but dubbed over, here comes the Bootstrapper. And we're going to have that bad boy playing um, at the start and the end. So um, Terry, put a shift in. We need those files, PDQ. We need to send uh, Terry a copy of this joe um but uh, i'm looking forward to sharing that with everybody and a big thanks to everybody for uh, for joining really uh, really appreciate everyone's time and questions and thank you joe for facilitating emceeing generally keeping me on message yeah it's uh it's always fun it's always fun why not spend your wednesday morning 8 a.m having a bit of fun and learning a few things so we'll see you next month and the recording for this will be available straight after on linkedin as well so thank you so much guys and enjoy your day well thank you bye bye